webinar on zero loss uh, thinking. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, how to, to identify losses and your potential, uh, then how to tackle those losses, how to make sure that you uh, eradicate those losses permanently, and how to go about building the capability to do this. Um, talking today is uh, Mark Thijs. I'm a consultant with uh, Möbius uh, Business Redesign. Together with me is uh, Mamar Tal, who will also introduce himself in a minute, and uh, so will be your facilitators for today. Uh, we have the opportunity to record questions, so uh, you can use your uh, questions panel on the side. We'll keep the questions and answer session to uh, the last uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so. So please do type your questions in that uh, box, and then we'll select uh, the key questions for the end of the session. So who are we? We are Mobis uh, Business Redesign. We're a medium-sized consulting company. Um, we have offices in, in Belgium, in Holland, in uh, France and in the UK, but we work basically on a European-wide basis. We work across uh, industry sectors, but also in services and government and healthcare. Um, we've got an history about, uh, of about 20 years, and uh, we also have a quite an extensive experience with uh, operational excellence uh, programs. We have been uh, an affiliate, an official Shingo affiliate for the past couple of years. The Shingo Institute is the home of the Shingo Prize, of course, and uh, I recognize as a very important provider in the excellence area with the uh, business excellence model of the Shingo Institute. I already mentioned uh, my name, uh, Mark Thijs. I've got experience of about uh, 25 years in operational excellence partially as a consultant, about 20 years in consulting, but also five years as an operational excellence head uh, for a pharmaceutical company on the one hand and for a, um, a food company called Mondelez on the other hand. I've got with me Momak Tal. Hello, everybody. So uh, my name is Momak Tal. I'm consultant in Mobis also uh, from two years and uh, I'm from originally from industry and experiences in operational excellence Lean Six Sigma and Shingo Prize obtained it uh, with Rexam Group uh, by leading the operational excellence of uh, Rexam in the world. Omar is a specialist on, on the subject. Uh, I'll be introducing the most of the concepts. Omar will go into more detail about how to set up your system. So what are we going to be talking about today? First of all, uh, we have a little talk about the principles, basic principles of zero loss thinking and why this is important. We'll talk about uh, building your zero loss vision, what you will be able to achieve in the next couple of years. And we're definitely talking about years because, because typically this is like a, a five to 10 year journey to build the capability on the one hand and to get the results on the other hand. So Mama will take you to uh, more detail about the components of zero loss management systems, which are loss intelligence, loss education and loss prevention. More about that later. And then finally, we'll be talking a little bit about how to build your zero loss uh, roadmap and how to get going with zero loss. So first of all, what are losses? Uh, you will see there's uh, quite a bit of confusion and, and some discussion about what is loss and what is a waste. Uh, it's not entirely the same thing. Uh, waste is very much a lean concept which uh, isolates uh, waste in, uh, on their own. What we'll be talking about when we talk about zero loss is how we can quantify some of those opportunities into uh, actually either uh, reduced cost or additional margin. So that's a very important concept. We should be able to quantify that into uh, an opportunity cost. So as the slide here uh, shows, it's not only about tackling costs that can be tackled, it's also about realizing more output. And by realize, realizing more output with the same assets, uh, you can typically get uh, more money and more margin. Um, another thing I would like to mention on this as well is that it's not just an industry related uh, topic. Um, this type of topic is, is actually applicable to any kind of uh, asset intensive industry. So I could be talking about logistics, for example, or transport uh, or even uh, healthcare, because we've been doing work as well in, in operating theaters, for example, where clearly some hospitals were not realizing their full potential in terms of capacity in the operating theaters. And uh, there we could help them actually to uh, get more out of their operating theaters and also reducing lead times. So that's uh, a basic concept that we, uh, we can apply across different industries. And uh, although a lot of the concepts are originally coming from uh, uh, industry, they are applied to a wide range of uh, sectors. Mm -hmm. 
to introduce you to the concept and how this is different from traditional thinking, we can look at a typical uh, slide or performance metric that you might see uh, in, a, in a factory. Uh, so it could be like something like uh, the performance of a line. And uh, typically, we would be quite happy with the performance of the line as long as the, uh, the green bars cross the red line. And, and then we would be happy. And this particular, in this particular case, we don't have concerns in about uh, two out of the 15 weeks that you can see here. Now, when we talk about zero loss, we sort of turn it on its head uh, and we look at all the losses that are going across uh, the different lines. And you see all the opportunities in, in the red lines here. Um, so it's not just the, uh, the lines which are not crossing the bar that are interesting to us. Actually, it's all the, the gaps that we, we can see on a daily basis or on a weekly basis or even on an hourly basis between the 100% realization and the actual realization. So what we're going to be looking at is the total, is the sum of all the losses that we have across all those 15 weeks. And that's obviously a lot more than just the three lines that are below um, the, um, or the three bars that are below the uh, target line that you can, that you can see on the, on the left side. So on the right side, we're really looking at the total opportunity across all the weeks and against 100% um, output. So really the focus will be on not just what has been achieved, but definitely on what has not been achieved and then understanding why it hasn't been achieved to the 100%. And that's really the basis of uh, zero loss thinking is understanding how big the opportunity is from a zero loss uh, point of view and then how we can explain why we didn't get to that 100%. And then obviously tackling those opportunities uh, in order of opportunity and in order of, of priority. So what is zero loss? Uh, what are some of the elements? Uh, first of all, we're looking at uh, our current processes. And a lot of the time we need to understand uh, how well they are performing, obviously. But then uh, a lot of the times we need to actually restore those work processes or equipment in their original state as they were designed. And then we can understand better uh, what is going wrong uh, with processes and equipment. Next step is, of course, is doing some root cause analysis uh, in order to, to tackle those losses and bring them to zero. And then obviously you also want to make sure that we can keep those losses there by establishing standards and not only establishing standards, also making sure those standards are enforced and then also monitored to sort of see whether or not uh, we are reaching those standards. And also uh, these standards also provide us for a basis for improvement. Every time we, we check the standard against reality, we can see opportunities to either uh, adjust the standard to, to uh, reality or uh, um, uh, identified gaps between reality and standard. And now we need to take some decision whether or not we, we can actually tackle reality and do something about it or actually change the standard. And finally, we'll talk about prevention. Um, there's different approaches to uh, loss prevention. And one of them is actually what we call robust design is that uh, uh, your equipment processes and products uh, or services uh, will perform to the same standards or the same level all the time, regardless all the influencing factors that are out there. So that's really what we talk about when we talk about robust design. So you could ask yourself the question, what is actually keeping us from eradicating all losses right now? I mean, it, it sounds very simple and the, the principle is actually very simple. Actually, how to go about it is a bit more complex because first of all, um, we have a lack of knowledge. We have a lack of knowledge of what these losses are, where they are, when they occur, how they occur and why they occur. So before we, we uh, know that, we actually can't do much about them. Uh, but once even we understand where the losses are and what these are, uh, we also may not have the capability actually to resolve them. So that's also a capability that we need to, to develop. And then finally, we actually don't know how to prevent them from happening. That's also a capability that we need to develop. So the key message here is that it's something that you need to learn. It's going to be a learning journey. And that learning journey uh, associated also with some change management uh, elements is actually the reason why it's going to take time. And in our experience and, and in experience with a lot of people, uh, it's going to take several years. It's not something, it's not a capability that you build up in six months of time. Uh, it's not about sending people to a, a black belt training and then having them do projects. It's about involving everybody in understanding where the losses are, in involving everybody to tackle those losses, and understand where they're coming from, involving everybody in developing solutions, and then also involving everybody in making sure those uh, losses are kept at zero.
So when we talk about losses and when we first start conversations with our customers about uh, losses, often what people see are only the main failures, the things that are appearing in, in the top level dashboards of the organization. And what we uh, notice is that often those uh, failures are actually only the tip of the iceberg. And it's a bit like the one of the previous slides where we've shown uh, that typically people only look at the bars that do not reach the, the target. Um, so actually then you're only looking at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, what is happening below the surface is actually a lot of things that are preventing you from achieving zero losses. And uh, this could be uh, direct simple as things which are dirty or uh, not kept in, in a, what we call a basic condition. It can be poor condition of, of machines and processes. It can be small things like uh, a small stop. Um, it could be things like adjustments that need to be done to process all the time. It can be uh, defects that we uh, we do not recall because they are accepted as normal. Um, and it could also be, you know, when we relate this to safety, uh, if you want to also make, you've probably seen this, this iceberg um, uh, model also when we talk about safety. You know, what we see are the incidents, lost time incidents, accidents. But what is uh, actually under the surface are those things which actually are causing those uh, incidents, which are then unsafe behaviors and unsafe uh, conditions. And that's a good example. I think uh, a lot of people have a lot of experience with, with safety now and understand that in order to tackle the, the causes of uh, incidents, you need to tackle the unsafe behaviors, unsafe conditions, and ultimately the culture. Actually, for zero losses, we need to do exactly the same thing. And it, it is, um, for the business results, it's just as important. So what do we need to do uh, in order to start uh, attacking those losses? First, the first thing that we need is, is we need to change the mindset of everybody in the organization. Uh, a lot of the time we've, we've seen things happening which we don't consider to be important because don't consider to be losses for years and years. And we've, we've learned to accept them as normal. Uh, that's one of the things that we need to challenge. Uh, when, a, when a, an equipment, for example, stops every three minutes or so, and then there's a minor adjustment that needs to be taken, or somebody needs to push a button to restart the machine, we now accept that as something which is normal. Actually, we need to see it something at, at, as something which is not normal. Uh, if you know that uh, for some companies that have been applying this principle for, for 20 or 30 years, companies like Unilever and Procter & Gamble, they consider that at the very minimum, if we have a, uh, an equipment running, it should be able to run two to four hours without any stops at all. And that's obviously a big difference from, from where a lot of companies are right now, where typically we see losses every two or three minutes. Uh, it's not just about stoppages, it's also about the fact that this creates other losses. Um, when you now have people standing there at, uh, at the machine, uh, a lot of people are just standing there to actually uh, restart the machine every, every time it stops. So you have a, a full-time person standing there just watching the machine and pushing a button every time it stops. Now imagine when you have, when you don't have that kind of situation. Imagine that your line doesn't stop for four hours. Now you might have only one person manning maybe three or four lines, which is radically then changing your organization and your organization structure. And that's where, where we need to start thinking about is, is not only just those incidents that are, that are causing uh, minor issues, but also how this affects the entire organization. And that's where often the, the main opportunities are. It's, it's actually rethinking your organization in terms of and in, and in function of zero losses. Then we, so once we start um, identifying those things as not normal, then we need some systems that are constantly monitoring our losses. And we also need standards that tell us what is actually normal and what is not normal. So we're able to identify, and everybody is able to identify those problems all the time. And actually monitoring standards, which, which uh, is one of the jobs of leadership, is making sure that those monitored standards are there and uh, that they are being followed. And when the standards are not being followed and, and we see a gap, that is also a, a, an early warning system that things are going wrong. Because in the end, you will actually create losses that have an impact on the bottom line. Thirdly, obviously, then we need to uh, uh, start developing some improvement plans. And finally, as we already mentioned as well, we need to design loss prevention into our systems, processes, equipment, and products. So we need to be, we need to start adopting a preventive mindset. What you don't want to have is, is starting up a, a brand new line, which where you invested a lot of money uh, and, and sometimes several million dollars uh, or billions of euros on a new line. And then you see that after six months, 
it's still only running at 25% of maximum output. And that is obviously a loss which could have been avoided by actually designing uh, your equipment in a way that actually it should start straight away. You should push the button and it should start at at least 50 or 60% of output within the first two weeks or so. Um, and that is often not happening because the serial loss mindset is also not there with the, with the people that are actually designing and installing that equipment. So what are the, the capabilities that we need in order to tackle losses? I'm just going to give you the key components and then Mama will tell us in more detail what they're all about. Um, so the three things that we're talking about is first of all the loss intelligence. The capability is actually the knowing the losses and then also prioritizing the losses before you can tackle them. And we'll talk about some of the tools that you can use there. Um, then the second, the second step is loss er eradication. Um, it's really identifying those losses and tackling them, uh, typically through root cause analysis and, and things like that. Um, and then thirdly, we have to think about loss prevention. How can, we, how can we make sure that we prevent those future losses? And also there's a couple of tools and uh, things you can do about that. So before we go into the details of that, just remember why we are all doing this. Um, and that, that's why we sort of build a zero loss vision and a zero loss roadmap is to sort of uh, develop the price and then keep the eyes on the price. Um, so a zero loss roadmap, and I'll give you an example at the end of the, the presentation, it needs to tell us how much we, we need to improve from a business point of view and by when. So how quickly do we want to do this? But also it should identify those capabilities that we need to develop in order to make this happen. As I mentioned already before, what is keeping us from realizing all those uh, loss reduction um, uh, and improvement events is actually the fact that we don't have the capabilities, the ability to do things, to do something about it. And so the, the, uh, the roadmap should also explain what it is that we need to develop in order to get to the result. What, what do we need in order to do that? First of all, is a good understanding of our current losses and also this famous ideal state, a vision of how much needs to improve by when, which is essentially given by the, the business strategy. And then uh, finally, as I already mentioned, a picture of consecutive generations of knowledge and capabilities to, to be developed with all people not just with a couple of black belts or with, with some leadership, with all people. It's not just about zero loss, it's also about 100% engagement across the company. So what does it, what's the picture that we often uh, show is, is how to get from your current state to your future state through a couple of intermediate states. So the zero state is a bit like, uh, you know, like zero defects before, it's something that um, is not attainable typically. You know? Uh, so 100 percent output all the time, no scrap, zero absenteeism, no unsafe behaviors and conditions. It's very hard to achieve that. Um, so in order to get something more realistic, we try to think about an ideal state. So if you assume there are no major technical organizational barriers to that, uh, we might be able to achieve something like 95 percent OE, 1 percent absenteeism, which would be like world class. Yeah? We can also think about the future state that we can we can achieve within a couple of years time and then work our way backwards to say, okay, when we need to start something like this, uh, what's gonna be our next year state? So understanding all that will be our basis for our zero loss roadmap. Uh, we go from current state to ideal state through a couple of generations and also not only a couple of generations of results, but also a couple of generations of capability. So that's about the zero's journey then. Uh, so uh, I won't spend too much uh, talking about this slide because actually it gives you a little, just a little bit more detail about what I've just shown in pictures in the previous slides. Uh, what will be, be important though, again, is, is uh, developing some additional things like metrics. Uh, we might now, uh, we may now have metrics which are quite high level and really don't help us to understand where the losses are coming from and where they are. And then secondly, we need to, like I mentioned already, also this capability at different levels and in different functions of the organization. So, next is uh, the details about the different components. And I'll hand it over to uh, Momana, who, are, who will talk you through these different components of uh, the zero loss uh, management uh, system. Thank you, Mark. So, um, 
to go uh, on the same line with, with, with Mark, I would like just to come back uh, to you about a simple example uh, for using zero loss, because many of you and many of us are thinking zero loss for a plant, but this is something that we can see and we can use in all kind of environment of business, including in the personal life. Imagine uh, you are a customer of a travel agency and you are going on a long waiting holidays. This is something that you are waiting to arrive on time, to travel safely, and to be sure that you will be happy during your holidays. But during that uh, travel, you can see a lot of situation. Here, for example, you have the exact situation as a plant. It's only something that we call setup and adjustment that you have in a plant. You have it in a personal life also. You have to adjust your luggages. During the same travel, you can have maintenance activities also. If there is a problem in the motor of your cars, you need to have to make some maintenance. So this is the breakdown that you have in the business line that you are, where you are producing. Here we have the short stop for the lighting on the right. Okay, and this is typically something that we not suspect every time in our business, and excluding production business. Here you have the example of the, let's say, traffics on the road. This is typically the speed losses. You lose some speed, so you are afraid to, ar to arrive lately on your holidays. And this is something that I can I, I can explain you well with the with, with the truck of with the Belgian truck on the road between France and Belgium every time I, I'm using the same highway. So this example is what we call the quality losses when you travel and you lose some something from your luggages, and you have the same problem when you have some lot of tough discussion and dispute with uh, the person which you are traveling. So this is typically the example of planning maintenance on your machine. So zero thinking is not only about machine always. It's about business in any case, but more than business per time, it's about environment where we are living. So this is what we have to focus. It's only focusing on added value act. So the approach, for the approach as explained by Mark, we have to know how to make the leadership of the zero-loss journey. We have to know exactly the intelligence of our losses, find our potential, our full potential, link it to some improvement. We have to be clear with our attack plan, I would call it like this. So we need to define first the volume deployment that we need to produce for our customer. Or we need to ship to the customer at the end. And we need to define the model of our business. You have also the loss eradication. The second step of the zero loss is to be able to improve your teams as skills, knowledge management, to grow the people to be able to have the loss elimination root cause also. And of course, to, to still be able to use the simple tools that you always are using in Lean, in Six Sigma Extra, Extra. So the step-by-step -step hand on approach. Everyone is involved and track the sustainability of results. On the loss prevention, you have to be sure that each pillar in your business is controlling on the right way and adapt the, 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 the correct tool that you need to use. So you need first to introduce a system to hold the gain and have a permanent culture change. And for the performance control, you need to be sure that you control the result that you have on the same and unique approach and methodology. 
in the different department, you have to use one unique approach and methodology. You have to communicate it well and to plan a dashboard that you need to show and update to your collaborators. So this is the impact of zero loss initiative on the plant or in the business performance. If we go deep in detail in the loss intelligence, here you have a typical example of loss tree analysis. The loss tree analysis is a tool to identify the major losses and to prioritize activities and strategies that impact your performance. So you cannot tackle your factory loss trees only by focusing on big things, as explained by Mark a few minutes ago. In the factory loss trees, you have first step to divide it by several sections. And after that, to divide it by line or, let's say, production zone or business zone. So on the main losses, you have to focus on several different kinds of approach to tackle the main big losses of your business. But the losses can be technical, but can be also something that we use in administration including in human resources, as explained by Mark. For example, here you have three categories of losses that you can define. You can have in a plant some shutdown, some unplanned production charge, some process failures, some quality defects, extra, extra. In your equipment, you have some downtime, you have some speed losses, and you have some defect, of course. So in your equipment, you need to produce the right product on the right speed while you buy the machine. If you buy a machine for a thousand uh, products per, per, per hour and you are only producing 900, it's not good. But you need to adapt it also, in the, on the other hand, with the need of your customer. Don't overproduce if it's not needed. You, ha you have zero loss activities also on end-to-end -end supply chain system about your inventory, your service level, your customer return, your non-value add activities, extra, extra. So zero loss as told by Mark is a real mindset. It's only focusing about value add. It's, if something is not added value for the customer, we don't need to do that. That's simple. So we need to focus on satisfaction of customer and satisfaction of collaborator inside the business. Here you have a simple example about OE loss deployment. Here, for example, the target on 2014 was 80%. So there was 20% of gap that we missed. In this 20, there was 11 unplanned and nine planned. So you have to, uh, let's say, cascade the losses on the details source, the real cause, the real source of your problem. Therefore, the 20 become at the end, 5% uh, of breakdown for, for, uh, for, for 5S, uh, for supply chain, uh, for, uh, for um, uh, extra extra and three for P for, for planet maintenance, two for operational extra extra. We need to cascade our global losses in detailed losses to be sure to tackle the real source of the problem. Otherwise, if we tackle the problem without knowing the real source, you can achieve some result, but we, it will be really complicated or not possible to achieve the sustainability of this result. And if there is no a sustainability of result, you will not be achieve the right culture in your organization. And it means only simply the happiness of your collaborators. And this is one key link with zero loss and personal working. The loss analysis. 
0 and 100 start in the plant, but then extend to the end-to-end -end chiplation. So it, it's, it's a really full value chain system. Big losses across the silo in the, the supply system. So big supply system losses can be inventory, as we told uh, in, in the previous slides, productivities, extra, extra. The second step of the zero loss, the loss eradication. We need to know that 80% of problem can be solved with really basic tools. So come to the basics element, really simple tools that you are always using. You can tackle this 80% of issues or problem in your organization by using some Kaizen events, by uh, resolving some defect elimination, some basics problem solving extra, by going further than the 80% also. The other 20% are the more hard that we have to achieve, but we have to achieve it because zero loss is not only focusing on waste that we can tackle easily. It's tackle the problem that we can resolve easily and then go to the more harder problem. Some problem recurring, simple to medium complexity problem solving tools. So we can use the skills of your black belts, for example, in your company. You can use the skills and the knowledge for your green belt and black belt by making some black belt projects. And this is something that we need to communicate to you four words to not avoid. It's for every kind of losses to be sure that we're gonna tackle these losses by eliminate the losses. If we cannot eliminate the loss, we have to try to contain it. If it's something that we cannot contain and control, we have to try to reduce it or to simplify it. So first of all, let's eliminate the loss if there is no issue about loss to eliminate go to contain it or to reduce it or to simplify it so it's not a disaster if your collaborator try to resolve some problem and do not achieve it to push them down no if it's a problem that you cannot completely eliminate, motivate, motivate your people to try to contain it or to reduce it or to simplify it. So the loss eradication is going also on the involvement of all collaborators. In the usual traditional uh, approach of operational excellence, there is a lot of initiative from too few people. So unexpressed and undiluted potential skills. The difference with the zero loss is all people around the involvement. All people are including and to make a continuous improvement culture with a single agenda. And this is the difficulty because, because as expert and in our experience in many companies, there is a lot of agreement about taking initiative and trying to improve things. But in general culture, we should have one and unit agenda to follow, including all projects and trying to build one team spirit in the organization. The third step of the approach is the prevention, how to prevent the losses in the future. So take the concept of the infinite loops. For example, here you have the example of the hunter, the farmer, and the rock cluster. Here you have the farmer. In this kind of organization, he should develop system to prevent losses. For example, preventive maintenance system or planning system. The hunter, 
He need to support the training and develop of improvement team. Audit the team, report critical points, develops needed training material, and monitor the reapplication. The example of the rock bluster is to support and carry on, to share with steering. So this road is the way to be sure that the result that you will obtain will be sustained and we can redo the same circle to improve the whole business. Maintaining the result, seek new improvement and discover new one and re restart to maintain, to obtain results, to seek and find new opportunities. This is the point about the loss prevention. And the last step of the approach of zero loss is the performance control. The point here is to try to get everybody happy. The smile on the face of all collaborators. How? To give the ownership to the people. In the organization, there is different level of, let's say, uh, responsibility. So each person need to take the ownership of his responsibility, but we don't forget that the operational people, they have some responsibility. So our role as manager is not to tell them always how, what they have to do, but only to share them how they need to make a reflection for building the right culture by the good behaviors. And to do that, we need to measure them all with the same methodology. The equitability of people measuring with the same indicators all departments between production, between supply chain and human resources. All collaborators should feel that they are part of the, organ of the organization, they are not excluding, and they can take decision, try to improve things. If it works, well done. If it's not, okay, they need to be able to explain the reason why it not works and the reason how, and, 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 and the next step, how to make it works the next time. So each person need to keep his responsibility and not to push down the lower collaborators. In this performance control, of course, we need to steer. So this, the role of this steering committee is to provide a clear direction and to drive the improvement activity of a global master plan. Why? Because in our experience, we can see a lot of organizations where people try to define a vision and to define a direction, and that's really good. But the point is, if it's a journey of several years, they, the direction can change per time, but they don't take time to inform the collaborators, the lower collaborators in the business. They just change the direction and continue to lead the business. And if, it, if it's something wrong, they're gonna indicate the collaborator to say, they do not know what we explain it. But the point is what you explain it from the beginning, change during the years. So you have to re-explain to communicate more, more simple and more short to the collaborator on the shop floor. So to define the vision and to keep it for the future. The point on this point of vision, many organizations define a vision, but when they start to get this vision in, for the future, after one year, it can be difficult and they say, oh, we have to change the vision. No, it can be hard. It not mean impossible. It mean try again. They have to get a leadership of guiding force and entire improvement program. To sponsor, to remove of barriers and roadblocks and to ensure activity are proving expected result. So accountable for the overall progress. This is the last word. I will say here. I'm going to give the hand to Mark to go deep about uh, the roadmap.
Yeah, so um, thanks for that, uh, Mama. So yeah, um, obviously we should always keep in mind that we, and I think Mama had in, in the last slide, uh, phrases that extremely well, you also need to be, always need to be careful to uh, um, loop it all the way back to the, the business needs and to the why we are doing this and what we are expecting as a business out of all this. We're not doing this for fun. We're not doing this because also Procter & Gamma and Unilever are doing this. We're really doing this to get results. Um, and how we're gonna get results is, is amongst other things by keeping our eyes on the price and having a, a plan. And as, as uh, Mama mentioned, uh, a master plan uh, that keeps us that in mind. So when you start building your zero loss roadmap, first of all, you should understand that uh, it's like any plan. Um, I think Eisenhower said plans are nothing, nothing. planning is everything. Uh, so you really need to think about how you can get to those, those results, um, how you're gonna balance the things, that is the results, the focus areas, so the priorities, uh, the different initiatives that you might have. So um, translating those improvement areas into, into more uh, concrete actions and projects and programs. And then finally, as we mentioned before, there's gonna be a lot of capability and learning uh, to be developed. And that's something that is going to be, um, if you want an iterative uh, thing, uh, it's going to be uh, trying th something also as Mama uh, pointed out and then seeing what works and doesn't work and then adjust and try again. So the, again, it's, it's the old uh, PDCA plan, do, check, action um, thinking that is behind this. On the other hand, you also need to make sure that you don't uh, be too ambitious from the start because indeed you need to learn. So uh, the first year will be very much about piloting and, and tackling some of those losses and involving a lot of people and uh, coaching people on uh, using those tools of, of loss analysis, loss eradication and loss prevention. And that's gonna take a lot of leadership time and leadership coaching. And so therefore you need to provide already sufficient time, not only to do all that, but also to learn from it. Um, it's obvious also that there's, there's going to be a lot of discoveries. Um, I've never seen any zero loss uh, journey start with a perfect vision, uh, a perfect picture of what is going to be discovered or what's going to be uh, needed or what's going to be done in the next five years. So every period, every year, you need to uh, um, plan ahead what you think you're going to do, but it's going to require a regular feedback loop to actually uh, understand what really happened, what are some of the gaps that you actually didn't uh, know about before, uh, some of the uh, capabilities that you thought you had and you actually didn't have, and then learn from that and adjust your plan. So that's something that you need to build in from the start. So yeah, also don't understand, don't underestimate the cultural change needed. Um, as Mamar also mentioned, is that in order to be successful with this, you need 100% engagement. You need to deploy this all the way down to the bottom, uh, all the way uh, across the entire organization. And that's gonna also require a different type of leadership on the one hand, and different type of skills from all those associates on the other hand. So that's gonna be a major cultural change. Uh, please do they take that into account. So one of the systems that we tend to set up is, is uh, uh, you know, Momar already mentioned the steering committee. So we need some kind of a governance structure and a governance process that uh, keeps all this on track. So uh, this is gonna be typically something that you're gonna be doing on a yearly cycle, but in order to incorporate the learning, it's probably very useful to have at least a quarterly update. And then also finally the monthly tracking that um, helps you understand where you are and how much progress you're gonna make. And even lower down, you could have, uh, you know, uh, weekly tracking on, on individual lines <clears throat> to see how much results you're getting. And you need that cycle, that PDCA cycle that also is mentioned here, because you want to identify uh, problems quite early and then learn from them. Yeah. So um, what you might be doing on a regular basis, on a, on a yearly basis, actually is, is update. And, and the first of all, define and update your loss tree on a, on a regular basis so that you have that loss visibility and you have full assessment of all areas which are important to the business. Um, then you make sure that you translate it into something which is a quantif quantified value and some projects and some initiatives that are against that, which are then translated into your master plan. Um, that should be very clear on what is the project pipeline, what are some of the priorities that uh, you have in there. 
obviously you need to uh, allocate resources. Uh, it's going to be a big challenge the first year to make sure that you actually allocate enough people beyond the traditional black belts and green belts, beyond the traditional sp uh, sponsor role, but also in involving first line supervisors, for example, you know, to develop, identify opportunities, develop people, uh, and uh, make sure that you get to those improvements and results. Then during implementation, you need uh, to make sure that you actually have some kind of a project plan for individual initi initiatives. And then uh, directly linked to that, you need to have some, some uh, tracking systems in place that can track lower level indicators. Again, one of the key challenges is gonna be translating your top level indicators that a lot of people have through already the financial system into something that you can track on a much lower level. Uh, and they're really on a shop floor level or, or even individual team and associate level. So they actually have a very quick feedback loop of what is happening and what is going wrong and what needs to be adjusted. Finally, uh, hopefully you will get something like this. This actually is, is a, an actual, it's not a plan. It's like uh, in retrospect, the journey that one company and one plant went through. I think this is a South American plant somewhere. Um, and you can see that or even in terms of timelines. What we're talking about here is not a couple of months. Uh, you, you, you can see here that they established their baseline already mid nineties. They had the phase one and phase two uh, pretty much completed by the, uh, the end of uh, 2001, 2002. But by that time, so that's already seven, eight years into the, into the program. Uh, they had achieved some remarkable results. Uh, if you look about mean time between failures from six minutes to 75 minutes, that's massive already, it's 10 times as much. But then if you then look at what they can still achieve in the next phases, phase three, phase four, which goes all the way, I think, to something like 2010, uh, they can still get a lot higher. And they can go from, from uh, 75 minutes to, to 240 minutes. They increase productivity still uh, uh, in a big way. Uh, defects still going down massively. And, uh, and still they can, in the final stages, they can still go to, to even better. Uh, and what you can also see is then what the things were they were trying to develop and do. Um, it started from, from small groups, then to, uh, to things which are, you know, uh, larger teams, larger groups, uh, more supply chain oriented stuff, uh, more, uh, I'd like to see more involvement of suppliers, for example, um, also more involvement of customers. And then finally, if you look at uh, the, the phase four, you can go to a, a very high level of performance Thanks to, from a, if you look at the bottom, uh, the organization and how it's now uh, organized in self-directed work teams and with very high levels of um, um, accountability, but also freedom of people on the shop floor to do what is necessary to reach, reach those targets. And also uh, all the other stakeholders, further development, further de uh, deployment of all stakeholders in order to get to those results. So that's sort of the picture that you might be able to achieve one day. But the, po the, the point is you need, need to start somewhere. And, but the somewhere is indeed starting from understanding your losses. Uh, we're going to start an, um, an exercise with a, a company in, in, in Germany. And they've got a, a, a very recognizable problem right now. They can sell anything they can make. Unfortunately, currently, the, the, what they re actually make is like something like two thirds of what the plan tells them, which creates all kinds of problems uh, across the supply chain. And obviously there's an enormous amount of opportunity which are being, being missed here. Um, and that's something that we want to be able to tackle. So that brings us to the, the end of the formal presentation. Uh, I see that we have a number of uh, questions here that we will try to tackle. And I think the first question is uh, already something that I'll try to identify at the start of the presentation is what is the difference between zero loss and waste. And uh, I'll, I'll leave that to Mama perhaps to, to try to explain that a little bit more. We'll go all the way back to that uh, original slide, which is this one. Yeah. And that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the difference is uh, uh, in the traditional way of operational excellence, we are thinking about waste. It means what I'm losing today. But many of us, when we ask this question, we are thinking about where am I, uh, am I and compared to where is the target. 
And the difference with zero loss is go about your full potential. Why to think only about the targets? No, the target is define it, but you can make more than the target. So it thinking about your full potential on you see on the right here, the full potential, not only focusing on this target here of 70%. So I can be happy when I achieve 70%, but I can still be happy to achieve 100%. So why to stop on 70% every week or every month? So the difference is on waste, you focus about what you are losing compared to your target. And the loss thinking of their loss is what I'm losing as my full potential am i able to achieve my full ability and potential this is the point i don't know if it and i, yeah. I would like to add a couple of things to that as well is you know in my experience when people talk about waste they tend very much to focus on on things they can they can see and observe on the shop floor which is which is great yeah? but the question is always what is the importance of that yeah and um why would I tackle one waste versus another waste? Uh, knowing and actually in, in a lot of cases, it actually is a compromise. Uh, you need you, you can you start tackling one waste, but you re need to replace it by another waste. So uh, what is the importance of the waste? That is, you need to be able to translate it into something which is important for the business. That's why we talk about quantified opportunities. I can see people standing around. I can see uh, inventory. I can see uh, transport. I can see movement. That's fine, and that is indeed an important information. But uh, you need to see it in a, in a context. And one type of context that, that context that we often have is like value stream mapping and, and a value stream vision. That's one type of uh, looking at it. Uh, this uh, the zero loss thinking is more about okay, how can I translate now this into an opportunity? Absolutely, something that I can do something with, something that has a, has a business value, and therefore it needs to take out the uh, the vision of the waste, which is often also in silos. I need to translate into something which is important to the business. And uh, I'll just give you an example of uh, something I've, I've worked on a couple of years ago. I was working in a logistics company in a, an express parcels uh, company, and we could identify waste in every step of the process. As you can imagine, um, in, a, in a, a FedEx or a UPS type of environment, uh, the speed of, of movement of parcels through all the steps is extremely important. And everybody was aware of that. Uh, unfortunately, that very siloed mentality was leading to huge amounts of waste, which people didn't recognize. Because, for example, they were unloading trucks at a huge speed. Huh? The problem was then, when you can then go to the sorting step, that all this unloading was done very quickly, and then the uh, sorting step couldn't cope with it. So uh, you had all this inventory waiting for uh, the next step. The next step was the sorting uh, step, and that's an interesting one as well, because uh, what um, the waste there was not obvious, but if you looked at, and that's what, where we go back to the, the essence of, of uh, loss intelligence. Yeah? Uh, what we can see at the sorting process was people loading parcels on their automatic sorting system. Mm -hmm. And they were working very hard and it looked like it was going quite smoothly. Yeah? Um, and then we looked at what management saw, well, first of all, we, we still thought there was a problem there because in terms of lead times through the operation, uh, clearly there was a problem somewhere and we suspected it was the, uh, the sorting system which was the main culprit. The management view was, okay, well, actually we have a problem there, but it's not such a big problem because actually our uptime of our um, sorting system is like 92 or 93%, which also, okay, that's, that's not too bad. It's quite good, actually. And, and said, yeah, but, you know, it's not good enough and we're going to increase it to 97%. Um, and it's going to cost us 200,000 euros. Okay. Then we started the loss intelligence um, exercise, really is understanding, yeah, but how much are you getting out of the system versus what it could do? And we measured that. It turned out it was only 50%. So it could do double that. In other words, when they would have increased uptime by like three, four, five percent they would have lost mm -hmm. half of that already immediately because they were not using the system optimally. And so then we needed to understand a little bit more what were the losses and actually the input of the system. And that had to do with the way work was organized and how people thought they needed to work 
And so one of the things that we need to do is actually develop new standards and new ways of working to actually utilize the equipment a lot better. So I think that's a good example of where um, focusing on localized waste is typically not good enough in order to translate it into something which is valuable to the business. Because in the end, what we need, indeed need to do with the sorting system, make sure that we use it a lot better so that parcels move a lot faster through the system and then can also deliver to the next step in the process, which is the, air, well, the aircraft or the trucks. Yeah, we have a, another one. Maybe I'll go to the uh, how to involve, and we can have a little discussion about that. You know, how to always involve uh, and motivate people. I think uh, when we go back to things like, for example, the shingle model, one of one things it says is respect for people. Yeah? So I think that that's where it needs to start, and it starts with a dialogue. And I think one of the things we mentioned in terms of um, prevention and control is a daily management system. Um, a daily management system should be a conversation, should be a dialogue, should be uh, a conversation, a dialogue about performance and how we can achieve performance and how we can improve performance. So actually, it start with that. That should be something that you do every day. Uh, and it should not be about showing figures to people. No, it should be about how did you do today? How well did we do today? Why didn't we do as well as we planned to do? What's your opinion? What do you think? What are the problems that you have? So it really needs to go back to the problems that people see yeah? and having a good conversation about. And actually, it's more of an education of, of supervisors and first line managers and second line managers than it is about the people themselves, because the people often know what the problems are, but they, they tend to feel ignored. Uh, yesterday, I was in a workshop where actually that, that same thing came, came about. What we tried to do was uh, reduce uh, some losses. Um, and people said, yeah, but you know, we've been identifying those problems already for 10 years and nobody's doing anything about it. And, and we think that what uh, management is actually currently doing about problems is not what we see, we see as problems. So I think it starts with that. It starts getting the voice of the associate or the employee at all levels and making sure that dialogue is there all the time. That's where it starts. And that's, I think, the, the key success factor in all this. Indeed. You're completely right, and uh, I have an example. Uh, yesterday, uh, in, 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 a, in a discussion with a custom, uh, with a customer with who we are uh, starting a new Shingo journey, uh, during the steering committee, our uh, sponsor was asking the question, uh, how to involve and to motivate our people? Because he said, I don't find the way. I propose to them to have some bonus, around 2,000 euro by year, so they should be happy and they should be part of it. And I was really shocking. He was disappointed about that, but he did not take time to ask to people, to people as you said, Mark, to ask to people, what are you waiting from, for, from this journey? What are you expected? He knows what is waiting by the company uh, leaders, the boss of the company, but he need to ask to people about the happiness of people also, about what they are waiting in the daily work. And if if this question, there is no response on it, people will be blocked. And if they are blocked, we will have a bottleneck to achieve the right culture there. So thank you, Mark. Good. I think so, that's about all we have time for. Uh, yeah. Um, I think everybody will, will receive a copy of the presentation. We will send that uh, to you if you're registered. And I think all of the people that are here should have been able to register, I think, yeah. Um, if you have more questions, please, please don't hesitate to, uh, to send them to us, to email, uh, and we will try to um, respond then on an individual basis. Um, apart from that, thank you very much, all of you, for your uh, attention and your participation in this webinar. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you at another occasion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.